And once again, it's Gabe Morales here with Gangsters, Cops, and Politicians. We have a very special guest today, Mr. David Contreras, and he's going to talk a little bit about what he does. He has a uh, podcast, a show on YouTube also, and we'll get into that in just a minute. But David, first of all, uh, how are you doing, sir? Doing great, Gabe. And once again, thank you very much. I'm honored to be on your show. And uh, thank you for being on my show several months ago. Uh, it was a blessing to have you on my show. Thank you. I, I remember that. That was, uh, you know, a little difficult, but I'm, I'm glad I did it. Uh, and as people will uh, hear in just a minute, there's a, there's a reason why David does what he does. And I think it's a good, it can help uh, a lot of people, especially men uh, that are dealing with different issues uh, from all walks of life. And so, David, tell us, where were you born and where did you grow up? You know, Gabe, I was born in Tijuana, Baja California, Mexico. At the age of six months old, we moved from Tijuana to uh, San Isidro, right there, right across the border. We lived there in San Isidro, I'd say, for about a year, year and a half. And then we moved to Chula Vista, and I lived uh, uh, in Chula Vista for 50-plus years. Uh, I lived in Chula Vista. Yes, okay. I was uh, raised in Chula Vista. Uh, in San Diego. Okay, very good. I know where uh, both those places are. You know, I was in the Marines, so uh, I went down okay. there quite a bit on on weekend leave before they stopped that. And uh, you know, people having uh, a few Marines having too much fun down there in Tijuana. But yeah, I know that area very very well. Okay. Um, and so, what schools did you attend when you were down there? You know, well, yeah, I mean, I went to an elementary school there, Palomar Elementary School. Then I went to Castle Park Junior High, Castle Park High School. Uh, I graduated from Castle Park High School, and from right there, I was going to go to Southwestern College. I actually went two a year and a half, um, and then I went back six months. I went back a year later, and throughout the years, I went back to uh, Southwestern College to try to get my AA degree. Then I got hired with the Department of Corrections, so I put my AA degree uh, uh, set aside, and then uh, I ended up uh, later on in life, when I was, I think, 43 years old, I went back, and then I finally ended up getting my degree, uh, my bachelor's degree, but uh, it, was, uh, it wasn't until later on in life when I got my bachelor's degree, yes. Very well, good. Okay, uh, let, yeah. let's back up uh, just a moment if we could. And then uh, when you were growing up, did you encounter any gangs down there in that area? Well, of course. I mean, I grew up, I, I lived in Chula Vista. And right next to Chula Vista, there was a barrio called Otay. And next to Oto, well, actually in Chula Vista, there was a barrio. There was a small little barrio they were called Chula Vista Locos. And, uh, and then right next to Chula Vista, I went to Kessel Park. And that was basically the Otay gang. Right next to the Otay gang, we had the Del Sol gang. I was mm -hmm. there when the Del Sol gang, that's where Bat Marquez came out of, right. Albert, Bat Marquez. Right. Uh, they originally originally started back in 1972 when uh, the candlelight homes were built. The majority of the guys from Del Sol were from Otay, and they moved to the Del Sol homes. They were track homes. Uh, they were very cheap at the time. I mean, less expensive than they were. They were brand new homes. So a lot of the guys from Otay went over there. They basically started their own barrio. Just south of there, right next to the border, you had another barrio known as San Isidro Locos. And within San Isidro, you had the midgets, you had the little locos, you had all kinds of Chicano little gangs. In between there, you had uh, Palm City Locos. Just west of there, you had uh, the Imperial Beach Locos. So, I mean, it was just like East L.A. It was just like uh, Inland Empire. Every, mm -hmm. little every little city, national city, you had the Gatos, you had uh, the Le uh, the uh, the uh, 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 OTNC, Old Town, Old Town National City. You had the Acre Boys. So every little city had different barrios and they were basically separated by different neighborhoods. So we had, we had, uh, I'd say over a hundred gangs in the city, just in the city of San Diego alone. So yes, I grew up in a gang infested area. The majority of the friends that I grew up with uh, became heroin addicts. Mm. Uh, a lot of them growing up got jumped into the barrio. It was funny, as I would go to school, I would see a lot of my friends growing, uh, you would see them come to school with black eyes. 
uh, there was one kid by the name of Junior Semurio, and this kid was a good kid. I see him come to school with a black guy, and I can name a, I can name five or six right now, top of my head. But I'm naming him. Uh, hopefully, maybe he might be watching the show. I haven't seen him since I was 13 years old. And I go, Junior, what happened? And he goes, Oh, I got jumped into the barrio. Orale, so you got jumped into the barrio. How many guys? Oh, five guys beat me up, and for 13 seconds. And it was funny seeing these guys, you know, get jumped in into the barrio. Yeah. But I saw that, and then through. Throughout the years in high school, I attended a lot of funerals, Gabe. A lot of the guys ended up, uh, I can name you three or four right now, the top of my head, that ended up getting in car accidents because they were drunk, uh, you know, crashing, uh, getting shot, getting stabbed. There's one guy, uh, I'm not going to mention his name for respect for his family. He actually died in my arms. Mm. He got shot on his head. And uh, I was actually in the church service worshiping the Lord. We heard the gunshots go off right there in Otai. We mm. ran to the park and he's laying there and I'm there praying for him, asking God to, you know, to heal him as the ambulance is arriving. He's bleeding in my hands and uh, he was shot. And he actually died in my arms at the age of 16 years old. And I can name you at least 10 guys growing up from the age of 12 years old to the age of 18 years old, at least 10 guys just from Otai alone dying uh, through gang violence. So today you hear about all this violence, juvenile violence. Dude, that's been going on in the 70s. That's been going on in the 60s in the barrios. So that ain't new to us. That yeah. new to us Chicanos, you know what I mean? To yes. the white folk in our in America, in our, in Washington D.C., in Ohio, they're amazed. Like, oh my God, you know, uh, school violence. That's been going on forever in the barrios. Yeah, you know, kids dying. You told me about your your experience when you were five years old, walking to windshields to buy a donut, five years old, and you see your first murder. So yeah. that's not new. And that wasn't new for me as a kid growing up, even though I grew up in Chula Vista, but uh, many of my friends died. Many of my friends became heroin addicts. So yes, getting back to your question, I know it's being long winded, but getting back to your question. Yes, I grew up in the barrio. I grew up seeing my friends either become drug addicts, become pintos, become police officers. A lot, some of them become police officers, become preachers or become uh, social workers or construction mm-hmm. workers. Okay, that, that that explains a lot. That was going to be my next question. Uh, yeah. Why did you get into your line of work? And it sounds like you already answered part of that. Well, let me tell you, Gabe, ever since I was a little boy, I always wanted to be a police officer. I mean, you know, you always have, you know, being a police officer, it's a calling. It really is. Since you're a child, I mean, some, some people, it's funny, growing up, in a neighborhood, growing up with cousins that were gangsters, growing up with your best friends that are gangsters. I truly believe, Gabe, and I'm gonna gonna go off subject just a little bit, but I truly believe that gang members are brainwashed. I really do. Mm -hmm. There is no doubt in my mind when you grow up, and for example, let me tell you a a story about a kid that grew up in Otay. A kid that grew up in Otay, the first thing out of his mouth, his father was a gang member. His abuelito was a gang member. We're talking about second, third generation gang members. So he grows up hating the guy from San Isidro, hating the guy from Imperial Beach. The guy from Imperial Beach is a Chicano just like him. Is is somebody that he probably played uh, baseball with and is just like him, has never done anything to him. Right. But because he's from another neighborhood, he grows up basically hating him and thinking someday I'm either going to hurt him or I'm going to kill him. That is brain being brainwashed from a very young age. Right. So that little boy that grew up in the grows up in the barrio, he sees Rhino coming out of the pinta. And when he sees him come out of the pinta, he thinks, hey, someday I'm going to be in the pinta and I'm going to come out just like that homeboy when he gets out. So as he's growing up, he's seeing that and he wants to be like Rhino now. And then he goes to juvenile hall. He goes to YA. He goes to a county jail. He goes to Chino. He goes to St. Quentin. And now he's part of that cycle. This kid is that grew up in the barrio. That's why I'm telling you, I truly believe that a lot of our gang members are brainwashed. I really do. Because that's part of the brainwashing system. They're brainwashed and they basically, that's what they want to be. When I was a kid, I basically, I had told myself, I want to be a cop. 
I want to be a cop. And you know what, Gabe? My first experience was a cop was a very negative experience. And because of that negative, negative experience, I told myself, I am never, ever going to be that cop. Amen. I agree. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, I also, you know, did a lot of things my, I, I did, uh, for, I think so. We had similar backgrounds. We've talked, you yeah. know, before this uh, broadcast yeah. several times. Yeah, we had very similar experiences, and uh, that that's good. Uh, that uh, for our viewers then to understand a little bit more about why we do what we do, why we do our shows, and why we try to still help people. And uh, yeah, there's some bad cops out there. I think you'd be the first to admit. Uh, but but a lot of cops and uh, cops like us, you know want to help people and even retired cops like this still want to help people yeah, and definitely. that was uh like yeah. you said was you know was a calling just like a priest for religion yeah. and so uh you know you can uh you know some people say you know given you know directive uh you know uh mission in life and so uh you know it wasn't just the blues brothers right uh you know oh. belushi and uh dan uh elwood on uh, the blues brothers you know on a mission from god we were on a mission from god and so uh then that's, uh, well, first of all, how, how many years did you work in law enforcement? I did, uh, well, I, I did 32 in law enforcement, and then I did five as a private investigator. I count that also law enforcement. Mm -hmm. So I did 36 altogether. Yeah. I did five, four and a half, five with the, with the California Department of Corrections, and I did 27 with San Diego PD, and mm -hmm. I did five as a private investigator in Mexico. So that's 30, 36 altogether. Uh, yes. 36 altogether. Yes. yes. You've been doing it a while. Yeah. I was 12 years old. And uh, like I said, I mean, I've always, um, I was that kid growing up. As a matter of fact, I'm writing a book right now. And I talk a lot about growing up in, um, in South Bay. It, it's a fiction, fiction, but I talk a lot about my personal experiences. I was that kid that was always defending the, um, the poor, the weak, uh, I was dog. always fighting. I was always fighting the bully. I don't care if that bully was six foot tall. I don't care if that bully was three foot tall. If I saw somebody picking on somebody, I was the first to fight that guy. I was the first to beat that guy. I was the first to get beat up by that guy. And, and, and knowing that I was that kid, I was that kid that the majority of his friends were the ones that everybody else shunned, that nobody wanted to be around. During our time, I don't know how old you are, Gabe, but I'm I'm going to be 62 in a couple of weeks. Um, and during my era, there was no such thing as special ed for kids. If there was special ed, there they were severely, severely uh, mentally handicapped. So we had kids that couldn't read. We had kids that uh, they weren't, uh, you know, uh, automatically placed in special training. Uh, they didn't have ESL, English as Second Language. They didn't have any of that when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. uh, so these kids, they, because they couldn't read, they were dyslexic. They were looked at mentally handicapped in class and they would still pass them, sad to say. So, so these kids were frowned and laughed at by other kids. And with that said, I remember I was 12 years old and I went to a, to a game, a football game between Castle Park and Sweetwater High School. There was a big rivalry because it was uh, Otay uh, or Chula Vista, basically Otay. Castle Park was all Otay. Otay against National City. There was a big rivalry. And at that game, there was a huge riot like never before. People were getting stabbed. Uh, the helicopter came. Uh, they called for assistance. The sheriffs, Chula Vista PD, San Diego PD, hundreds of cops showed up riot everywhere but they didn't cancel the game the game was going on so i could care less about the riot i love football so i'm watching the game and i remember uh the officers formed a skirmish line and they're moving people to the side and i remember i'm watching the game and i'm hearing you know uh, steve Contreras is getting ready to tackle somebody his name is coming out. i still remember uh coming out over the pa system and i remember a cop coming up to me and i'm watching the game i'm standing there 12 year old little chubby little boy standing there and this cop I remember he had a black baton straight baton and I remember he hit me so hard in the solar plex right here that he literally took the wind out of me 
I mean, and I fell to the ground. And as I fall to the ground, he steps over me and he keeps pushing people to the right and to the left. And as he's pushing everybody, uh, everybody's, he's Trump, he's Trump over me. Everybody's trampling over me. I remember I had a black and blue mark on my chest for at least three months, a black and blue mark. And I remember every time, but when I got home that night, I remember I just looked, my whole chest was black and blue. Mm. It, it lasted three to four months. And I remember every time I looked at myself in the mirror and I looked at myself and I said, I will never, ever be that cop. I will never, ever be that cop. And as I grew up and as I became a police officer for the city of San Diego, as I became a correctional officer, I would always remember I will never, ever be that cop. I will never, ever beat a child like that. I will never, ever beat a man that is handcuffed. You know, when the fight is on, that's rock and roll. But once those cuffs are on and once it's over, it's over. You know what I mean? And, and I'm telling you, that right there, um, I still would have been who I am, but that right there was an eye opener for me that I would never be that man. So that was that was a, a learning experience for me. Now, getting back, what was your question? Sorry okay. for the long answer. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. no, that, that's okay. No, that's all uh, all good. It tells us, uh, it tells me, and tells our viewers more about why you do what you do, and that you're yeah. a fair and just man. Uh, yeah. And so. Cheap dog assist. Please okay. tell us a little bit more about that and uh, what you do and why you do it uh, on your show and how people can watch your, your YouTube show. You know, one of the things, Gabe, that uh, when I retired from the police department, um, I was that guy that I never believed that police officers or anybody other than military combat veterans, not even military, but combat veterans suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder. I believe that they were the only ones that suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, anybody else that I would hear or um, just hear that they were suffering, I would think, yeah, okay. Only combat veterans, veterans that were in the war, uh, were in Vietnam, were in World War II, World War I, that were in Afghanistan. And uh, after I retired, uh, I moved from, uh, after I, I sold my company, where I gave my company to my business partner, I moved to Florida to write a book. One day I'm walking on the beach with my wife and I get a phone call from a detective uh, from uh, that had worked for me. And he calls me and he says, Sarge, he goes, uh, I'm tired. He goes, uh, I just retired and and uh, I'm tired. He goes, I can't sleep at night. Uh, I'm having a very hard time with retirement and I just can't live anymore. I can't live anymore. And I go, I go, what do you mean you can't live anymore? You just retired. And he started telling me, listen, I miss, I miss kicking ass. I miss uh, work. I miss uh, uh, having purpose in life. I miss being at work. I miss, and he started telling me everything, he told me other things that I'm not going to share. And as he's telling me that, I'm listening and I'm listening to myself. I had never told anybody this. And as he's telling me all this, I talk to him and uh, I go, listen, I go, let me do some research. I go, and everything you're telling me, go see a doctor. And I start giving him advice. So I started doing research and everything that he was telling me, having anxiety, that was, mm -hmm. I, I have a lot of anxiety. I, uh, I have uh, paranoia. I can't be around people. Uh, everywhere I go, I, I, I have no patience. Everything he was telling me, I started and I started doing research and I saw he has PTSD. And as I'm reading about him, I see myself. I have PTSD. And I'm thinking, well, I thought that only combat veterans have PTSD. And then I started seeing what PTSD is, how you get PTSD. If you're a victim or a witness to a traumatic event, you basically can have PTSD. Just being a victim or a witness to a traumatic event. And then I'm thinking, well, combat veterans are victims, uh, are witnesses, experience traumatic events. And I'm thinking, as a cop, how many times did I witness suicides? 
How many times did I witness dead bodies? How many times did I witness murders? How many times did I witness assaults? How many times was I the victim of an assault? And I start looking at all that. And then I started thinking, well, we as cops suffer from PTSD. Mm -hmm. And then I started looking at, well, one other thing that I saw that I was addicted to or that, that I not addicted, but I also suffered from was I was addicted to adrenaline. Mm -hmm. And then Gabe, I think you're going to be able to to uh, to uh, associate your life with this as a police officer. We basically respond as a police officer, a correctional officer, as a police officer, we respond to critical incidents during one day, maybe one to two critical incidents a day. When I talk about critical incidents, it doesn't have to be a SWAT shooting. It doesn't have to be a, a, a hostage situation. It could be walking, we could say driving out of the barn, walking out of lineup. As we're walking out, all of a sudden you hear your partner say, I'm on a foot pursuit. I'm on a car chase. All of a sudden from that moment on, Gabe, your adrenaline goes from zero to 100 when you jump in your car and you're going 100 miles an hour to get in that chase. And if you're part of that chase, you're going through red lights with lights and sirens. And then all of a sudden you hear code four. And code four means that the guy's either in custody or you lost them, everything's okay and or not okay. There was an accident or whatever. And then all of a sudden you went from zero to 100 and your adrenaline, it went zoom all the way up. And then all of a sudden now it has to come down. And as it's coming down, you are literally, Gabe, like this shaking because it's coming down because you went like this up. Oh, it's coming down as a cop and as a correctional officer. How many times as a correctional were you at, at Folsom prison and all of a sudden the alarm went off? And then I don't know about you, Gabe, but me, when I was a correctional officer at Donovan and also at CMC East, even today, Gabe, I'm talking about back in 1984, 88. Even today, I could be walking here at uh, uh, Fort Lauderdale, and if I see somebody running, it still startles me, because the only time people ever ran working the pinta, working the joint, was what? The only time they ever ran was to an alarm. Even today, it could be a little kid. It still startles me. Why? Because, once again, that was a traumatic experience, because why did we run to alarms? Why? Because there was an incident. There was an incident. So now could you imagine, Gabe, as a police officer, seeing this for 25 years, two to three times a day as a police officer, your adrenaline goes up mm -hmm. from zero to 100. Did you know, Gabe, that a normal human being there, they will experience an adrenaline rush maybe one to two times in their lifetime, Gabe, in their lifetime. Now, being a cop, a correctional officer, you're experiencing it one to two times a day. Could you imagine that? Mm -hmm. One to two yeah, times a I day. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. I, yeah, that happened to me. You know, uh, I was just going, I was just thinking too, yeah. uh, you know, I mean, it's really good what you do. And I know a lot of people like yourself and like me really don't realize that they have that PTSD until their career is over and like you said that one guy you know having suicidal thoughts but i know there was also some guys who ate their gun you know that i remember oh uh, many and uh, yes. it always and still. sad and and yeah. i wish they had reached out to me and, and a lot of times i didn't see it coming it just happened and mm -hmm. why didn't you ask for help and i know it's uh there's taboos a lot of taboos in society and in our line of work it was taboo to show weakness you know, it was in the Marine Corps. It was taboo to show weakness. Uh, growing up in the in the barrios, in the, you know, in the, in the in the hoods, the ghettos, a lot of times it's taboo to show weakness, and that's unfortunate that other men will ridicule any man who has any kind of emotions and feels bad over something, and so you know you have this false armor. A lot of times, I think that they're wearing. And uh, for some guys, you know, it, it just, you know, they can't take it no more. Like I said, uh, whether they're on the job or after their career is over. But it's just terrible to me that uh, that there's that uh, mentality. And it's, you know, and especially in the Latino culture, you know, very macho and stuff that uh, and in other cultures, too, that, you know, you can't ever as a man let your guard down, you know. 
it's it's a uh, it's a hard thing. I say men because you know it happens to men. It doesn't just happen to men. Sometimes it happens to females too. But I think females tend to seek help a little easier. You know, there's a little less taboo, if you know what I'm saying. For men, it seems that there's that taboo, man. Uh, you hear about uh, new officers getting ha- hazed all the time. I've, I've read several articles about officers getting hazed and some of them took their own life, you know, and it happens in, you know, college fraternities and stuff too, but it just, that's terrible. I think that we treat as men, we treat other men so harshly, you know, don't have compassion. And it becomes, uh, to me, it seems like it becomes a trait kind of where a lot of people in our business uh, become very callous because, of that, you know, hey, I can't show weakness and callous towards other people that may show weakness, you know, very, very little compassion sometimes in understanding and caring. You you know, Gabe, there's a saying that says when the music stops, the pain begins. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I'm telling you that uh, happened to me when the music stopped, once I retired completely, after I retired from the police department, The day after I retired, two days after I retired, I had a full knee replacement. And it was after my full knee replacement when all of a sudden I went literally from that Monday retiring from serving a high risk search warrant with my team. Literally, I was working narcotics at the time. I was Mm -hmm. a team leader, the sergeant, literally serving a high risk search warrant. And then Tuesday, going to Donovan State Prison and literally having lunch, believe it or not, my son and I with Sirhan Sirhan. That's another story that's very interesting. Literally having a sandwich with Sirhan Sirhan. Mm. And then and then uh, Wednesday, having a full knee replacement. From, Tuesday, from Monday, my pager was going off every hour. Uh, my cell phone was going off every two hours. From that was my lifestyle. That was my lifestyle to all of a sudden Wednesday, I have a knee replacement. Tuesday, I have no pager. Well, forget the pager. I didn't even have a pager. I'm lying about that. My cell phone. That was my pager and my phone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my yeah, phone, pagers yeah, go way back. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I don't know why I said pager. I, I don't know why I said pager. I meant cell phone. At one time we carried a pager. Yeah, yeah. yeah because but not yeah, that it was time. cell phone. Yeah, yeah cell phone. Uh, my cell phone is complete. I have no cell phone. When I retired, they took my cell phone. They took my computer. They took my car. I had to buy a computer. I had to buy a cell phone. I had to buy a car because I literally, I mean, I had a car, a cell phone, and a computer for years. So all of a sudden, I have no cell phone. I have no computer and laptop, and I have no car, and nothing is ringing. All of a sudden, the music stopped. And that's why once my leg healed four months later, my adrenaline, I found out that I was an adrenaline junkie Mm -hmm. because I was like a cage lion. I am surprised my wife didn't leave me. I am surprised my wife didn't leave me. I was like a cage lion. I was angry. I was full of hate. I was full of anger. I was that guy after retirement that everybody was like, oh my God, let's travel around the world. I was that guy full of, because when I retired, I was so cynical. I was that guy that was, uh, everybody was a piece of this. Every, well, that guy, I remember right before I retired, I'm sitting in my patrol, I'm, well, I was in a patrol car in years. I was sitting in my uh, undercover car with another sergeant. And as we're sitting there, we're waiting for uh, to hit a house, but we were going to have a briefing right there at headquarters before we went and hit the house. And we're sitting there and we're about an hour early, me and him, we're having a cup of coffee and all these officers are driving in. And I remember me and this, this the other sergeant and as these officers are driving in, we're looking at each other. He's a piece of shit. Oh, that's a lazy bastard. That's, and people are driving in. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden I looked at him and I go, you know what? I think it's time for me to retire. I am so cynical. And we both laughed about it, mm-hmm. but that's who I was. I had become from loving and trying to help younger officers. I had become that cynical officer mm-hmm. after 27 years. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, so now well, when you see a lot of ugly, yeah. uh, sometimes oh, yeah. people you become, become ugly. You become ugly. Yeah. Yeah. You become ugly. Mm-hmm. So now I'm healed from my knee. So that's when I told my wife, you know what? I'm going to open a PI company. I'm going to start working in Mexico. And I started working in Mexico. I started doing a lot of work. And every time I'd cross the border, my adrenaline, it was an adrenaline rush for me. 
Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Every mm-hmm. time. So it wasn't for the money. I made good money. It wasn't for the money. It was for the adrenaline rush. It was because I subconsciously, I still wanted that adrenaline rush that I lost being a cop. Right. And you then that was, fix. Yeah. Yes. That's what it was. It was subconsciously that adrenaline rush, going to Cuernavaca, going to Morelos, going to different parts of Mexico. It was that adrenaline rush. But it was when I moved to Florida to write my book. And when I got here that there was no more adrenaline rush, when all of a sudden the music stopped. And that's when the pain came. And once I got here, I started doing my research and I started seeing that I suffered from it. And I'll tell you, Gabe, one of the things that helped me uh, when I was here, uh, my son was going through some because I was a terrible father. I was that guy. My father used to always say, uh, David, because my father was a minister. He was a pastor. He was a bishop in the apostolic church, Pentecostal church. And I was a black sheep of the family. I should have followed after his footsteps. I did it. I was completely the opposite. And for 36 years, I lived without God in my life. And I know this isn't a God show, but I got to tell you, for 36 years, when I left uh, the church in 1984, became a correctional officer, I, I lived a godless life. Uh, I my My God was work. And I was very good at what I did, but my God was work. I was there 24-7. I lost my first wife. I lost my kids. I lost my house. I lost everything. And I'm alive by the grace of God. And it was 36 years later that I'm here in Fort Lauderdale that my son had some a lot of issues. And God used him to bring me back to the light. God used my son. And one day, God used him. And here in Fort Lauderdale, um, in our, we have a nice gym here in my building where I live. And I'm in the steam room by myself one night. And, and I'm just so miserable because now I know I'm sick. Now I know I'm addicted to adrenaline. Now I know why I am so angry. I'm so cynical. And it was there, Gabe, that all of a sudden, whether people believe it or not, I don't care. I felt God's power. I felt uh, it was even, I mean, it was a steam room. And yes, it was full of steam. I was there by myself at 10 o'clock at night. I felt a presence go in there and I fell to my knees and I started crying, Gabe, like I've never cried before. I was weeping like I've never wept before. And when I came out of that steam room, I came out a new man. I came out healed. I came out healed because I was full of hate. I was full of anger. I was that guy with that sergeant that was criticizing every poor cop that went through. I was just so full of hate. And it was then that God placed a burden in my heart to help other cops, to help other people that I know what it's like to be cynical. I know what it's like to have hate. And I know what it's like to have love. And I know what it's like to want to help people. You know what I mean? And yes. even though I was full of hate and anger, and I was still a good guy. I would still buy burritos. I would still help people. And I would still turn informants. I was very good at it, turning informants. I was very good at every Christmas buying all my informants, their families, their kids, Christmas mm-hmm. gifts. I had a good heart. Right. But you know what? But I was black inside. Yeah, it sounds like you're yeah. really hard on yourself. That's where yeah, you're, your heart is. Yes, yes, I was. And I'm telling you, Gabe, uh, God just, and I'm not perfect. Trust me, I'm far from perfect. But but that's where sheepdog, that's where this came in. It's sheepdog. I mean, in life, there are wolves, there are sheep, and there are sheepdogs. And you and I are sheepdogs. And we were brought to this earth to protect the sheep. You were brought, we were brought to this earth to protect the sheep. And and I'm telling you, Gabe, your show, I know a lot of gangsters because I saw you on the Rojo uh, Flaco show. Mm-hmm. And I, I listen to their show. I like lo- watching their show. I like mm-hmm. watching another guy named Gunner. And I mm-hmm. like watching uh, uh, LA Times. I like watching all those gangster shows. And I'm telling you, um, I like to be on the show maybe sometimes. I like a lot of gang members suffer from PTSD. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, people in the barrio suffer. It's not only police. It's not mm-hmm. only Uh, A lot of ministers, a lot of uh, what happened, Gabe, uh, after that incident or after that 
experience that I had. Uh, God placed it in my heart to put together a curriculum where I wanted to go to police departments, to churches, to anywhere, and offer a four-hour free curriculum. Gabe, I will never make one cent from Sheepdog Assist. I will give. I will never make one cent. If God, if I ever make one cent, let God do whatever he's going to do to me because I will never make one cent. I will give with this Sheepdog Assist. Assist stands for Active Critical Incident Stress Trauma. I made that up. Instead of PTSD, I call it Active Critical Incident Stress Trauma because you know what? We get a lot of the trauma from our stress from a critical incident. So I made that up. That's something that I made up. So if, you, if somebody wants to use Very it, feel good. free. I never patent it. So Very knock good. yourself out. And, and so yeah. how can they, uh, David, tell people, uh, tell our viewers, how can they watch your show? How do they- you know what? So what happened, Gabe, for a year, I uh, basically, we got hit with COVID, right? So I couldn't go. I did one class. Uh, some members of LAPD came uh, there in Fontana. I have my sister's church. They have Fountain of Truth. And uh, it was very well received, a four-hour training class. Everybody mm-hmm. loved it. And then we got hit with COVID that mm-hmm. March. Uh, I had uh, LPOA invited me to teach at some of their conferences. Uh, uh, a guy by the name of Joe Prado, you know him, mm-hmm. yes. right? Mm-hmm. Joe Prado, he mm-hmm. invited me to teach that summer. Well, they invited me to teach that mm-hmm. summer in, I think it was going to be in Las Vegas, I was going to teach this course there. And then they got, we got hit with COVID. So all that cans was canceled. So instead of doing that, I basically, once again, I had, you, you could teach an old dog new tricks. I learned how to use, and I got a, a good friend of ours, uh, JC, to help me put together a, a YouTube channel. And uh, we have Sheepdog Assist at the time. And uh, I basically started calling old friends, people that wanted to be on my show. And I started with cops. I started with pastors, their wives. Uh, and next thing you know, I got nurses. I got uh, convicts. I got Mundo, uh, a former hitman from the Mexican mafia. I got Ruben Palomares. Uh, a former police officer. I got uh, Norm uh, Welch. I got all kinds of people. Next thing you know, I got a group of people. I mean, I got probably over 30 people that came on my show and talked about their struggle with PTSD. So it was a big blessing. But this year, I'm starting something new, Gabe. And and what I, I started Sheepdog Assist. But this year, my show has been picked up by police and fire publishing. And uh, they picked up my show and now I'm under their umbrella and I've changed. I'm still talking about PTSD before there were testimonies. Now it's basically called purpose driven mission oriented. And I started off with a guy by the name of Pete Bollinger. Mm -hmm. Pete Bollinger, he's the owner and president CEO of police fire publishing. He's the one that made the movie Mundo. Uh, the hitman, and he's also the one that just made the movie uh, Kilroy, and he's mm-hmm. also published, I think, over 30, 40 books. Yes, um, yes, uh, he, yeah. he's published uh, one. Andy Eways and uh, me wrote a book on Sorenius that is okay. under uh, police yeah. and fire publishing. Yes. And he was like me, he was a detective sergeant for the city of, uh, of Santa Ana. He was my first guest last week. Tomorrow, my second guest, he's going to be coming out on my show, is David Bejerano. He was the first chief of police uh, of color, a Latino, a Chicano for the city of San Diego. And only, believe it or not, in the 100-year history of the San Diego Police Department, they have only had one person of color. And David Bejerano was the special, uh, was the chief of police. And I was his special assistant for three years of my career. And then next week, I'm going to have the former Tijuana chief of police on my show and uh, the most violent city in, in, in the world. He's going to be on my show. And then in two weeks, I'm going to have Brian Perry, whom used to be Joe Morgan's first, uh, or not first, but Joe Morgan's a parole officer. And Brian Perry is a legend. Yes, in the prison gang world, and also a legend among cops and a legend in the California Department of Corrections. Yes, He's yes. going to be, and I got so many other. I got I got a group of about 20 guys yeah. that are ready oh, to come. I know you have some good guests on there. Uh, yes. Uh, you even had one uh, named Gabe Morales. Okay. <laughs> yes, that's right. Gabe Morales is going to be on my show. Definitely. Yeah. Yes. 
Yeah, I, I know you had some good guests on there. I've already watched yeah. your, your episodes many times. And, and yeah. uh, congratulations on the, uh, Thank the you. new kind of the new angle of the show. I know you're yeah. going to do some similar things and maybe a little bit different things. So yeah. well, once again, how then, uh, David, how can people find your show? What should they plug in if they're on in a major search engine to find your you show? You know what? All they have to do, Gabe, is go to uh, YouTube and go police and fire publishing. And there they could see my shows, Sheepdog Assist. They'll, they'll see Sheepdog. They'll see all the Mundo Chronicles. All Mundo's Chronicles are on there. And then we're also going to start basically uh, reviewing a lot of books. As a matter of fact, we'll probably be reviewing a lot of your books with your permission. I know okay. you're a writer sure. and a publisher. So we'll probably be reviewing a lot of your books in the near future with your permission, of course. Okay. But uh, yes, it's all going to be there and that. It's all under one umbrella now. And uh, I'm telling you gabe i am so excited because i, I have some great, <laughs> i got some great guests coming in but it's not only police and corrections but i also got community activists i got community members coming in that i worked with when i worked in logan heights when i worked in mexico and they're coming in giving a different perspective on basically being purpose-driven and mission-oriented you know because you're good. never too old to have purpose in life and you're right. never too young to have amen mission. amen yeah. Right on. Well, thank you, David, for coming on the thank show you, here. Brother, really, uh, it. I'm, I'm yeah. glad to see you know you you happy and excited, and I wish you more, even more success in the in the future. God willing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gabe. Thank you, and God bless you. All right. Take care. Thank you. Goodbye. God above. God above.